Who. Um, my name is Ben and I work here at the museum in the education department. And this is one of our maritime heritage series uh, presentations. So we offer these pretty much throughout the year. The bulk of them take place in the off season, uh, fall through spring. We've done a few in the summer. Um, <clears throat> today's slideshow presentation is the Great Beaufort Hurricane of 1879. Um, but I do wanna put in a plug for the next Maritime Heritage Series presentation which will be on September 21st. The title is Going at Sea, and it's exactly what you think it might be. Um, <clears throat> when nature calls, you have to go. But the question is, where do we go at sea? For some of us, that might be easier than others. Um, the, the answer for some might seem simple. You may be surprised uh, with some of the different uh, methods. Um, this presentation looks at the unique and creative ways that people have been relieving themselves while at sea. The lecture covers the time period of the last 300 years. Um, and this presentation does contain potty humor. So that's a disclaimer. Um, that will be given by our associate curator of education, Christine Brin. Um, it'll be on September 21, 11 o'clock in the morning. So most of these lectures take place on Thursdays at 11. We do have a printed out schedule available for those here in the building today. It's on the information desk in the lobby. Um, so these are free lectures. We're a free admission museum. So for those watching at home, um, if you wanna watch here in person, please come visit us. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And what I'm attempting to do here is uh, give a slideshow presentation with lots of images about this great Beaufort hurricane of 1879. Why did I pick this storm? Uh, well, to be honest, um, I had given and prepared and given a lecture as part of our uh, whales and whaling symposium. We've taken hiatus from it during the COVID years, but we'll be back with one in the spring of 2024. But this, why, you might be wondering why, why did he talk about a hurricane in a whaling symposium when they talk about wet marine mammals and, and the, the historic practices of catching whales off of North Carolina's coast. Uh, well, there was a particular whale ship from New England that wrecked during this hurricane um, in August of 1879, and it wrecked out at Cape Lookout. And I was talking about that incident and more particular about the whale ship itself. And you're going to learn about that whale ship today. But I started to think about it. And I said, there's so much more to this story of the great Beaufort hurricane. Uh, it really requires its own presentation. And because I'm so fortunate with my job that I can be doing something different every day, I said, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna talk about the hurricane. Uh, and I talk about all kinds of things here. Um, and hurricanes are definitely maritime related. They form out in the ocean. so. I have that luxury to do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I've got uh, a lot of slides to get through. Um, I want to kind of, I'm not gonna really go into hurricanes themselves and how they form and where they are, um, you know, cause I wanna spend most of my time on this one particular storm. Uh, I'll name a few that, that people might be familiar with. Um, and I've got some pictures there, uh, some graphs to kind of, hit the point home that you know hurricanes happen <laughs> and they'll continue to happen and they've been happening for a long time and sometimes they're very bad um, sometimes they just brush past us or they go farther west uh, and they don't seem to affect the coast that much um, but sometimes it's the opposite and they're terrible and you live through one and you don't ever want to do it again but you also don't ever want to leave the coast um, <laughs> so for those of us that live here, uh, it's quite a conundrum, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started. Let's look at some more pictures here. Um, okay, here's one of my boring slides, uh, but there's information in here, so it's useful. Um, over the last 100 years, about 265 storms have affected 
North Carolina. When I say affected, it doesn't, I don't necessarily mean they made landfall or directly hit North Carolina. Um, you know, they could have actually made landfall in the Gulf and then tracked up along the Western part of our state and wreaked havoc in the mountains by flooding streams and rivers uh, or downing trees and power lines. Um, and this chart covers di um, direct hits that we're looking at here to the Atlantic and Gulf Coast states from the period 1851 to 2014. So I just really just wanted to give you a general idea that North Carolina ranks pretty high on this list of direct hits, fourth uh, in the country. So Florida's number one. Um, I'm definitely probably not gonna move there anytime soon. Um, and then it looks like Louisiana comes in second and Texas. You know, Florida's got a really big coastline, really long, hence the reason probably it gets the most direct hits. Um, Louisiana just happens to be in a bad spot, I guess. <laughs> and Texas also has a long coastline. We have a, a long coastline ourselves, but um, you know, we're not no, nowhere near like Florida. So, all right, uh, another boring slide. I, I apologize, but I felt like this was important because um, for those that may have not lived here long or are visiting here, you may not realize that uh, the peak of hurricane season happens in September. Um, we are in hurricane season right now. We've been pretty fortunate so far this year. Um, and if you look at the number of landfalls in North Carolina since that 1851 date, the majority of them happen in September. So August is pretty bad. And then September's the worst. Um, and then things drop off pretty drastically from there. So just climatologically speaking, um, September is, is a bad time of year for hurricanes typically. Um, okay, let's move through this. There will not be a test afterwards, so you don't have to memorize any of this. I can barely memorize it myself. I have my notes, I'm reading off the slide. And if you see that there's a bunch of text on the slide, it's not only helping me, it's maybe for those that want to read along uh, with the images or for those that are, that are watching um, over the internet and they don't like my voice, they can just mute it and read the slides themselves. As it mentioned earlier, this is also being recorded. You're not being recorded, I am unfortunately. Um, and people can watch it later on our YouTube channel. So there's lots of different options. For, there's no excuse why no one should know about the storm of 1879 after this, okay? That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, here's some examples of um, what, what hurricanes have done um, here in North Carolina. Uh, we know that ships are pretty vulnerable. Now, I got some contradicting notes on this particular image. Um, you know, there's a, this image is from the Outer Banks History Center archives, uh, and handwritten on the image, which we don't know when that, the text was written, but it said 1899, um, but it said the E.S. Newman. The E.S. Newman wrecked in 1896. So they either got the date wrong or they got the ship wrong. <laughs> we don't know, unfortunately, with this image, you can't see the nameplate on the stern of the ship here. Um, so I don't know for, for certain, maybe someone else does. Um, maybe you can let me know after the presentation. Um, but you can see the storm of October, 1896, pushed this particular sailing vessel up high and dry onto the land. You can see even someone checking out the situation in their little horse and cart. Now, Pea Island is on Hatteras Island, if you're not familiar with the coast of North Carolina. Um, here's another one. Well, now, we are pretty certain that this was the August 1899 storm, uh, the San Siriaco hurricane, uh, named for uh, the devastation it caused there in the Caribbean. Um, and this is the wreck of the Priscilla. The man that you see sitting there is Erasmus Midget. Some people call him Erasmus Midget. Um, he is from Hatteras Island and he was a US lifesaver. He responded to this shipwreck incident during the storm and he rescued uh, some of the survivors off of the shipwreck single-handedly. Um, we have a replica of a life-saving service medal on display in our gallery uh, that was awarded to Erasmus for that heroic rescue. Um, we know it's the Priscilla 
because you can see right down here along uh, the remains of the of the ship. So, uh, another bad storm that was Gull Shoal, uh, Hatteras Island. Um, here's one from a little farther south. Here's Wrightsville Beach. This is July 1908 storm. Uh, you see a bunch of people there on the bridge that connected Wrightsville Beach to the mainland. And this, I don't know if this picture was before, during, or after the storm, but the hurricanes themselves push a large volume of water up against the coast. And that's when the flooding occurs, not only along the beachfront, but in the interior waters as well. Um, it pushes the water through the inlets or over the island directly, and it fills everything up back behind the island in the marsh and the creeks and the rivers. So in this July 1908 incident, it looks like the bridge to Wrightsville Beach got messed up pretty good. Uh, and I say that I don't know if this was during the storm because um, it doesn't look like it's raining. It doesn't look like it's very windy, maybe a little bit. I see some, uh, a white cap or out here rolling in the water, um, but everyone's standing out here on the edge of the bridge, kind of surveying the scene. Um, I mean, isn't that what we do? We, we go out right after the storm and check out the damage um, and, and hope for the best. I'm gonna try and project my voice the best I can for those here in the auditorium where the air kicks on like this. Uh, it keeps us nice and cool, thankfully, but at the same time, you might not be able to hear me as well. If you wanna move closer, I promise I don't bite. Uh, all right, here's another storm, the 1933 hurricane. This made landfall at Ocracoke. I don't know the exact location of this image, but it was along the North Carolina coast. We've seen, so, so far we've seen boats damaged, bridges damaged, and now buildings damaged from hurricanes. Um, this September 33 hurricane was the one that cut open Barden's Inlet. If you're familiar with Cape Lookout and Shackleford Banks, Barden's Inlet was cut by a hurricane, uh, the one in 1933 here. So. Okay, another image, you might not have heard of this one, the Great Atlantic Hurricane, September 1944. Remember the storms uh, tend to be more frequent in September. This is out at Ocracoke. Uh, I, I didn't find this picture until today, so I had to throw it in there um, because it's got a lighthouse and I love lighthouses. There's the Ocracoke Lighthouse, uh, but also because it's got the mail boat Alita. The, the Alita was a mail boat that carried not only mail, but also passengers. Um, along the Outer Banks uh, from Atlantic and to Ocracoke. And, um, <clears throat> and here, both of these vessels, the Alita and the Miss Willis are up, uh, looks like a fishing boat, are up high and dry on Ocracoke Island after the September 44 storm. And there are folks there trying to see if they can figure out how to get float those boats again. Um, and they look like they just kind of were rested there Fairly easy, easy. So maybe there wasn't too much damage to them. All right, here's a big one now. Now this is a time where the storm's starting to get a name. Um, this one's Hazel, 1954. Some of you might even remember it. This picture was out of Southport, which was probably hit the hardest as far as Hazel goes. Um, so now we see more destruction of buildings and boats up on shore. Um, so hurricanes are bad stuff. Now I got some conflicting information on the picture here on the left. Uh, this is from the state archives. It's, it's from a collection from the Carolina Power and Light. Um, I guess there was someone surveying uh, damage for Carolina Power and Light and they took pictures of anything they saw. Um, that, that archive collection says it was the Hurricane Donna from 1960. I've seen people say that the picture on the left was Hurricane Hazel. I'm, I'm going with state archives and, and uh, saying it was 1960 Hurricane Donna. So that's the, on the left is the Moorhead City and Beaufort Causeway or the Radio Island Causeway, if you wanna call it that. Um, you don't have to be right out on the beach like the picture on the right, which is the Dunes Club in Atlantic Beach or, or at least the roof of the Dunes Club. <laughs> Obviously the building was destroyed. And the interesting thing in that picture, you can see the Oceanana Hotel. That seemed to do all right. 
the older structure, the original Dunes Club didn't fare so well. There's a modern day Dunes Club there now. And I think, so I think that's actually the third Dunes Club that they're on at this point. The second Dunes Club just was remodeled or, or torn down, I think. Yes. Right here, yeah. it's a train. A train? Oh, yeah, okay. it's a train engine. So someone was asking what, what was in that picture on the left there. Um, so yeah, that you don't have to be on the beachfront to be destroyed. The causeway is not on the ocean front. You can stand on the causeway and see the ocean and that's part of the problem. If you, if you can see the sea, the sea can see you. Um, and sometimes the sea gets angry and comes to pay you a visit. Um, there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, here's, so there's a lot of uh, buildings, structure, but the natural environment gets affected by these storms as well. Here's um, overwash from Hurricane Dennis, Core Bank, September 1999. Um, so the storm surge comes from the ocean side and pushes the sand and the dunes back across the island into the sound, the core sound back here. Um, so that's not the only thing it can do to an island, a storm. Um, it can create an inlet. Uh, I already mentioned Barden's Inlet was created by the storm of 33. So how does it create an inlet? Well, it just cuts right through from the ocean side if it wants to, when the direction the wind and the, the waves are coming from the ocean side, uh, or it can actually cut from the sound side out to the ocean after the wind typically switches, the eye go, or the storm goes past. You've got this large volume of water built up in the Pamlico Sound um, and coming down from the rivers and the wind switches and busts a hole out the barrier island from the backside. So you might get an inlet as a storm approaches, and then you might get one as it leaves. <laughs> Just depends on how lucky you are, I guess. Here's an image of um, taken in 1940 of Core Banks, uh, Cape Lookout, Shackelford. So there's Barden Inlet in the early years of its life. These two islands were connected at one point. The storm of 33 opened up the inlet. And look how much if you know what it looks like today, wreck point or power squadron spit, whatever you want to call it, it changes so much. It's just sand. There's a reason why my, my parents put sand in a sandbox for me to play with as a little boy because it was easy to manip manipulate. Um, unfortunately for islands, it's the same situation. The sand is easy to manipulate. Here's another more uh, recent inlet uh, for Dare County. This was Hurricane Isabel on <clears throat> cutting an inlet between Hatteras Village and Frisco. That was 2003. And on the right, you're like, oh, it doesn't look like a big deal. That looks just, just like an undeveloped barrier island. But you have to remember that Highway 12 connected Frisco and Hatteras. And here's Highway 12. As it goes into Hatteras, it's covered in sand. Um, and you say, well, I've driven that recently and it's, and it's fine. <laughs> it took a lot of work <laughs> to put it back together with dredges and bulldozers and repaving. It's just become a way of life really up there. Um, you know, I had the, the picture of Core Banks and Hurricane Dennis and we know that Core Banks is a pretty low and narrow barrier island. And when you look on a map and you start to see Drum Inlet and you see Drum, Old Drum Inlet, Drum Inlet, New Drum Inlet, New New Drum Inlet. I gave up, I can't keep up with Drum Inlet. <laughs> it, there's so many of them. Um, I don't frequent that stretch of the coastline that much. So I feel like it's okay for me to give up. I don't need, I don't need to know where Drum Inlet is at this point in time. I just know that it's out there somewhere and there might be more than one of them. Um, here's an example of historic and present day inlets on this map here. As I mentioned, you know, they're, they're very dynamic. They can form quickly um, and they can, they can also fill in. Um, <clears throat> so some of these still exist today. 
uh, like Oregon Inlet number eight. Um, you know, <clears throat> there's Ocracoke Inlet number 16. Um, so we're way down here in Beaufort. You can see the little laser pointer. Uh, and there's Beaufort Inlet. It's historically been around for quite a long time. It's been a historically deep inlet, but, but take a look at this on Bogue Banks. So this would be Atlantic Beach and then moving westward, you go down to Emerald Isle. It says that there was three historic inlets on Bogue Banks. Well, when and where were they? Not, not in any terribly recent time. Um, I hope they don't come back because there's a lot of stuff built on Bogue Banks right now. On Bogue Banks? Yeah, they're just marking. I mean, you look up at the top there. So, for um, yeah, Bogue Banks. Num it says number twenty nine. They just called it Bogue Banks number one. Number twenty eight. They called it um, twenty eight. Actually, had a name, Cheeseman's Inlet. Anyone ever heard of that? I I had it until I started learning about these the, the islands more and the inlets. Twenty seven. They just called Bogue Banks two. So geologists believe that there was an inlet there at one time or another, um, and they, but they don't know exactly when, I don't think. Uh, and look at all the inlets up in Dare County that no longer exist. Uh, and in Currituck County, we had Currituck Inlet, New Currituck Inlet. There was some here around where um, Kitty Hawk, Kill Devil Hills, maybe Nags Head. So I just wanted to point that out that you know, this is what these hurricanes are doing. Hurricanes are not fun. Um, so let's kind of focus back in on this 1879 time period. Uh, this is a uh, map actually from the Goldsboro Messenger depicting the North Carolina coast in 1879. You can see the rail lines and the counties are shaded there in different colors. Um, you know, the, the larger centers of population on the coast uh, really what I guess would have been Wilmington, um, you know, New Bern, which you know, not really out on the beachfront there. I found this, uh, these numbers for the, the census for Carteret County, and I have three years there, but if you look on the right, the closest to the time of our hurricane we're learning about, 1890, they say the population in Carteret County was about 10,000. And that's all of Carteret County, which we know Carteret County is actually rather large compared to some others. Stretches from the White Oak River all the way to Cedar Island. Um, to in 2021, the population was almost 70,000. And I bet now we can add a few more <laughs> just by judging from the traffic um, since the, the pandemic. Uh, but, but you know, basically, the, in some ways, they were fortunate that things could have been worse with some of these storms in the past if there were more people and more buildings. Uh, today, there are more people and more buildings. Um, some of the buildings are stronger, but they can still be affected by hurricanes. So uh, these next few images will kind of drive home the fact that things were pretty sparsely populated on the, the, the islands and the coast of North Carolina. Here's, here's what it might've looked like in some of the places on Hatteras Island around 1900, pretty modest homes with the exception of this one on the right, that was actually the home of a doctor. And I think that's why it was a little, little bigger and a little nicer. They said that this one here in the bottom center was somebody's house. It looks relatively new. Um, and I'm not 100% sure it was actually a house, but the archive records said it was, um, they, they could be wrong. So here's another structure up here. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Maybe that'll go away. Um, there we go. This is on Hatteras Island. You can see there's not much else in the background. Uh, this is how folks were getting around on the island, a horse and a cart, maybe you just walked. It was easier to just get in a boat and sail up the island and get out and do, and, and do what you were doing. Um, uh, here's a picture of Ocracoke, and this is even later in 1940. 
still, you know, no paved roads. Um, got around in the same manner on land. So can you imagine 1879 in Ocracoke was even, <laughs> even a little more different. Here's 1950 in Portsmouth, you know, isolated community out on the Outer Banks and it just, just never a large, you know, Portsmouth, the, the population was larger in the, in the 18th and early 19th centuries than it, than it was in the 20th century. Um, here's a little hand-drawn map of, of the area. This was drawn in 1875. So I want to kind of paint a picture of what the area looked like. Um, here's Beaufort Inlet and vicinity, 1875. Um, and it's what's interesting to note is, you know, where where's all of the Rachel Carson Reserve? You know, okay, uh, there's Carrot Island. People probably recognize that name. Here's another name, Town Marsh, Bird Island Shoal. Things look pretty small, these islands, you know. There's no such thing as Radio Island back then. Um, Piper's Island existed, and I bet it's probably this little one right here. Um, there's no bridge to connect Moorhead City to Beaufort. You have to get in a boat and sail across the Newport River if you want to get there. Um, even though it might have seemed pretty remote and not much going on, the time period at the time period, people were coming here to escape the heat and humidity and the bugs of the coastal. Uh, plain of North Carolina. So it was becoming a, a tourist destination well before we might think it was. Um, here's a postcard image of the rail line where it came into Moorhead City and then just stopped at Shepherd's Point. And I'm not sure the date on this one. I couldn't find a date on this one, but if I had to guess, it was probably early early 20th century. Um, street scene in Beaufort, circa 1910, dirt road there. I think this is probably close to the west end of Front Street, if I had to guess, but I, I might be wrong. I don't know. Um, you see a lot of uh, those are agricultural products like cotton probably getting ready to get shipped somewhere. And here's the waterfront in Beaufort. Now, really examine this picture um, because this is like we're on the waterfront looking out to the water. And look out past the dock and look out to the horizon. This is in 1907. Um, I think that might be Shackleford Banks out there. So you're standing on the waterfront, and you can see Shackleford Banks. That means that none of Town Marsh or Carrot Island really was blocking your view. And in reality, much of Town Marsh and Carrot Island were probably nothing more than a tidal flat, salt marsh grass, or, or a sandbar exposed at low tide. There's no elevation to them at all whatsoever like you see today. So if you can leave my presentation and walk right across the street and look at Town Marsh, it's the only reason it exists like it is today is because it's dredge spoil that was dredged and pumped and deposited and elevated. So looking in this picture, I see lots of boats out in the creek, Taylor's Creek. I see net reels with fishing nets on the um, spooled up, rolled up on the reel to dry out. I see some range markers that the, that the ships would have used to help navigate into Beaufort Inlet. I think I see Shackleford Banks out on the horizon. So what does that all mean? It, it means that Beaufort was pretty well exposed to the water and Beaufort Inlet, which means the, subsequently the Atlantic Ocean. Um, 
that's not going to play out too well for the story of the, the Beaufort hurricane of 1879. All right, here's a drawing of a, of a hotel that existed in Beaufort. Um, this was the Ocean House Hotel. Um, it, was, it was renamed after a uh, fire um, damaged it and, the, and it was um, repaired and they changed the name from the Ocean House to the Ocean View Hotel. Um, the newspaper clipping on the right you know, talks about the Ocean House and um, how wonderful it is and the rooms and, and the sea bathing that, you, that could take place nearby and the pleasure boats that you could sail on. The view in front of the house is very fine and worth a visit to any stranger. The broad expanse of the ocean lying directly in front. Uh-oh, that don't sound good. <laughs> uh, three lighthouses and Fort Macon being embraced in one view. Three lighthouses, wait a minute, what does that mean? Um, 1857, they're referring to a lighthouse that was actually by Fort Macon. And, uh, and they're referring uh, to a lighthouse, um, the original lighthouse at Cape Lookout. And those are the other towers, 1859. So I don't know if they're talking about a lighthouse uh, that I don't know about or maybe the, the construction of the 1859 tower. Uh, sea breezes, uh, stables. Um, so it just, there's an advertisement basically for this ocean house, ocean view hotel. And um, this is the scene on Front Street and uh, lots of people around trying to you know, entice you to, to stay there. It sounds like a wonderful place. Here's an example of the, the sailing that you could do. And some, I think some people said this was a family that was out on the Julia Bell. Um, little Sharpie uh, sailboat here. Um, but also I, I've heard or read that this, these were actually tourists that were being taken out for a boat ride. Um, so that's what you did for fun. Uh, people still go out on boats for fun today. Um, here's a, another article on the Ocean View Hotel in Beaufort and that was from 1878. Um, Ballroom, bathing houses, croquet ground, boats, fishing. Beaufort offers superior advantages to those who delight in catching the finny tribe. The table will always be furnished with the best that this and the adjoining markets afford. Um, Dollar fifty a day uh, for for a night. You can stay there thirty dollars for the whole month. Uh, here's some surf bathing near Beaufort. This was probably happening on Bird Shoals, but the, the waterfront of Beaufort uh, was nothing like it is today back then. And there was actually little beaches uh, here and there of, of just sand. Um, so very well could have been on the Beaufort waterfront, but I don't see any of the net reels or range markers or boats in the background. Um, and this was 1911, so a little bit later. Uh, okay, here's a hand-drawn map of Beaufort 1885. And I just wanted to point out the ocean view. There's the ocean view hotel. But it was interesting to see some of the other buildings and such that existed. I see a lot of general stores. Here's a salt house, um, a bakery on the waterfront, fish house. Um, and then a lot of the kitchens were kept separate. Uh, one, because they got so hot, but two, if the kitchen caught on fire, you wouldn't want it attached to the main building. I see a lot of kitchen back here, kitchen. So here's Turner Street. What did we have on Turner Street? Ooh, uh, restaurant, uh, eating house, grocery, meat, jewelry, printing, general store, uh, barber. Well, it's just a nice little look into what Beaufort was like in the 1880s. Um, so a lot of these buildings were, were rebuilt um, more than likely. Let's let Martina into the room. She wants to watch. <laughs> so the Atlantic Hotel was another hotel that was on the waterfront. 
Um, the ocean view was actually on land. The Atlantic was actually built, as this picture shows, over the water on pilings, three stories of it. It's a pretty massive hotel, ballroom, music hall, dining, parlors, bathing houses, croquet, bowling, billiards room, a shooting gallery. I don't know where that was at. A flying trapeze. <laughs> I don't know where that was either. But that, I, this is what it said in all the advertisements. That's the information I got. The string and the brass band would be playing. They had surf bathing and rowing and sailing and fishing and hunting in uh, nearby. So uh, quite an attraction. Um, the Atlantic Hotel, as advertised in the Charlotte Observer in May of 1878. Um, this building lies directly over the water, the tide ebbing and flowing daily beneath it. It has been greatly improved and is now the only first class seaside resort in North Carolina. The table will be supplied with every luxury and substantial that that can be procured from land and water, $2.50 a night. Children's and servants half price. Um, a bar is attached to the hotel and will be supplied with first class liquors. A good band of music has been secured for the season. Open June 1st to October 1st. That's the Atlantic Hotel. All right, here is an 1888 chart of the US Coast Survey showing Beaufort and vicinity. Um, <clears throat> some reason uh, my image gets cut off. So but anyway, so, all right, looking again at these islands. All right, here's Beaufort Inlet. Here's Fort Macon on Bogue Banks. Um, it looks pretty exposed. So that hand-drawn map that we saw was pretty accurate. This says Carrot Island, as we know, off to the east. There's Town Marsh. Um, Bird Island Shoals looks to be more like just a sandbar, um, but very well exposed, the downtown and waterfront of Beaufort. Um, and not much going on in Moorhead City at the time. We, these little black dots represent structures. So there were a few. There's the rail line that came in and stopped. So notice that it did not connect um, to Beaufort. It doesn't actually connect to Beaufort. Um, until like 1906. So some time would pass. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the storm here. The second storm of the 1879 season, uh, and it would be the strongest to hit the area, um, possibly on, on record. Um, so we're gonna move into the storm here. This is the general path of the storm. Um, the landfall occurs between Topsail Island and Swansboro. And if you know about hurricanes, that's that the north um, east quadrant is kind of the worst, the strongest. So with a landfall, the eye somewhere between Topsail Island and Swansboro, that puts every part of the worst uh, section of the storm to the east of Swansboro, which means Carteret County. Um, the highest uh, winds and storm surge occur probably right where we are <laughs> um, today. So what's today? August 17th. Um, so Sunday, August 17th, 1879, the weather starts to deteriorate. Um, a few days earlier, the locals of the area spot the ominous man of war bird, which is actually a frigate pelican. Um, it's not a real pelican, it's kind of a pelagic um, mostly pelagic uh, uh, bird, similar to a shearwater. Um, but when people in this area saw this bird and other tropical birds, they saw it as a bad sign. This was a bad omen that a storm was approaching. They didn't have the weather channel. Um, they barely had um, the signal service, uh, which was mostly there to just observe weather and write down the, the record the, the weather of the day. Um, so they see this bird and, and why it's a problem. Well, the bird normally resided in the tropics in the Caribbean. So what's it doing up here? They were at, they were actually, these birds actually get pushed by the storms. They don't wanna go into the storm and the storm's too big to go around it. So they actually get pushed by the storm and move out in front of it ahead of the storm. 
so they they saw this and some of the some of the local folks said yeah something's coming that's not good and they actually started moving some of their smaller boats up the creeks and and uh, away from the open water and um, securing what they could um, so there was a signal service um, weather signal service officer that the weather the the weather um, signal service was the precursor to the to the national weather service and I, I got a few slides on that here in a second but uh, they were they were stationed out at Fort Macon and they raised the storm flag which I, I believe even at that time period would have been the the, the red square with the black square in the middle um, a lot of people said that the service officer told the manager of the Atlantic Hotel a storm's coming you might want to prepare but some people said that that was just that wasn't actually true uh, they said the hotel manager said you don't know what you're talking about the federal government's not going to boss me around all these people are here in town um, they're here for a good time I'm making money buzz off um, but I don't know if that conversation actually took place um, I had contradicting accounts on it um, so by Saturday August 18th a full gale has set in and by the early morning the winds are recorded at Cape Lookout where another weather service office was uh, the winds are recorded at 138. That already puts it at a category four. Um, now, the anemometer that he was using blew away at 138. So he said that it, the signal service officer estimated, he said it's getting worse. It's no longer 138. And he estimated that the winds reached 165. That's a category five. Um, and when you research and you look up, you know, the storm in 1879, you don't see it being posted on the, the, the worst storms of our history. And is it just because they're going off of this guy's estimate after he saw the anemometer blow away at a category four? They can, can't, we can't confirm it was a category five. You know, this guy's job is to sit there and watch the weather every day. If you go out and you watch the weather every day and you get and you listen to the, the weather service and they say today it's 15 to 20 knots, 15 to 20 knots, today is 10 knots, today is 20 to 25. You actually can get pretty good at judging the wind speed just from seeing what's going on around you and feeling the wind on you. So if he says it was 165, maybe it was. I, I guess we won't really know for sure. Um, so that, that early that morning, the storm surge begins flooding Front Street at three in the morning. By 5 a.m., the, the water had risen to the floor of the Atlantic Hotel and the winds are exceeding 80 miles an hour out of the southeast. So it's basically blowing water right into Beaufort Inlet and then it's coming right up here to Beaufort. Um, evacuation of the hotel guests began at five in the morning. So they were all asleep. Some of them maybe. The wind was picking up gradually through the night. By 6.30, there's eight feet of water on Front Street. Now, I'm, I'm not anywhere near six feet tall, but so if you can imagine eight feet, that's pretty deep. Now, what was Front Street like in 1879? It's probable that the elevation of Front Street today is higher than it was back then. And, it, and Front Street was not as long. Uh, it actually stopped um, at a certain, certain part along the water. Um, but still, eight feet is pretty is a pretty good storm surge. Um, all right, here's the little bit on the weather service. So, in 1870, the U.S. Army Signal Service Corps becomes responsible for preparing and recording weather reports. This would lead to the development of the National Weather Service. Um, you know, they take meteorological observations at military stations, uh, in the and at other locations, um, and are and are responsible for giving notice. Um, on the Great Lakes and the seacoast um, for the approach and the force of storms. But I mean, really, like what really could they do? <laughs> it's getting windy. Um, there's a frigate pelican. <laughs> the swells look like swells before a hurricane coming. You know, I don't think there was anyone surfing back then, but they might have been able to tell you. Um, yep, these are ground swells from a hurricane. <laughs> uh, so anyway, th but this was the early attempts at warning people that that 
you know, about weather situations. So an officer was stationed at Cape Lookout in April of 1876, and they would contribute weather data. Um, they lived on the second floor of the keeper's quarters, and there was also an officer at Fort Macon, like I mentioned. Um, so they had these monthly weather reports. Uh, most of what they were doing was just going into um, displaying cautionary signals, uh, and it was out at Cape Lookout, uh, and it was used by the local boaters um, to help uh, see what the current conditions were maybe. And, and, and they might be able to say, oh, you know, the weather's gonna get bad. So what did it look like uh, out at the lighthouse at that time? This picture they say is from 1893. Okay, there's the 1859 tower. The 1812 tower's gone, but here's the original keeper's quarters from the 1812 tower. The 1873 quarters where the weather service officer was stationed is hiding behind the lighthouse. So you only see the, the sides of it. Um, but look at how barren the island itself is and how flat it is. There's more dunes today, there's more trees. Um, so, and it's possible that it looked like this in 1893 because of some of those hurricanes. <laughs> um, all right, back to the, oh wait, here we go. Yeah, Private H.J. Foreman of, of the, where the, the Army Signal Service is going, he's stationed at the, in, at the keeper's quarters, and this is what he reports. The howling of the wind and the rushing of the water past the station woke us at 5 a.m., the 18th, velocity at this time being 80 miles per hour and rapidly increasing. The anemometer cups were blown away at 6.35 a.m., at which time the register showed a velocity of 138 miles per hour. The wind continued increasing and the water continued rising until 7.35 a.m. when the velocity was estimated at 165 miles per hour. This is the direct quote from Private H.J. Foreman who was out at Cape Lookout in that 1873 building on the second floor. I bet he was a little nervous, but at the same time, he was probably just in complete awe that he was experiencing a category five hurricane and seeing it right out his window. <laughs> um, it veered to the, it had veered to the Southwest, meaning the wind and commenced abating. The tide was falling, the barometer rising and the darkness which had enveloped us was slowly lifting and gladly we hailed the appearance of light, which some here never expected to see in the land of the living. The whole island, Core Banks was underwater. He said, the signal service mule, which became loose when the stable washed away, tried to come to the dwelling house, but could not face the raging storm. She turned and rushed into the foaming billows. She was found the next day on Whitehurst Island, having swam two miles. We, we have a, a survivor story, a station mule. Um, you know, I, here's the, uh, the lighthouse. That's where the mule was. And then the next day she was found way up there on Whitehurst Island. Um, you know, so all of this was underwater. Notice in this chart, um, there's you know, the islands connected Shackelford and Core Banks. Remember, Barden's Inlet didn't open till the 33 hurricane. Um, you know, so that was kind of, a, I thought that, that little story about the mule was interesting, I put it in there, but in reality, devastation took place. The storm surge rises. Guests had to escape the collapsing Atlantic Hotel. Some are jump, jumping from the second and third floor windows and wading through chest deep water on Front Street. Mind you, this is in the dark. Um, oh yeah. Uh, other waterfront buildings were swept off their foundations, one of which a family was still in and they were re rescued from. Survivors were cared for by local residents and housed in hallways and in kitchens. So at the Atlantic Hotel, it was, um, I don't know, it was 140 people that were staying there. There was a big press association conference meeting and Governor Jarvis of North Carolina and his wife were actually at the hotel during this storm. Um, so everyone's basically abandoning and, and trying to save themselves in the early morning hours of, of the 18th. Um, Here's that picture again. Just wanted to remind you, you know, this is a very calm day in 1907. 
Think about what it looked like and what they were dealing with in that storm. After the storm, uh, much of the county is in, in ruins. Practically every boat in the water at Beaufort was sunk, damaged, or stranded on shore. Uh, they say a sloop was washed 200 yards into town by the storm surge. Uh, regionally, over 100 large vessels were lost in over 200 smaller boats. This was an article out of the Greensboro uh, that talked about Beaufort in ruins. Um, At midnight, a terrific storm arose, the wildest that has been known here for years. The wind blowing from the east. At five o'clock this morning, the wind veered to the southeast, sending the heavy surges rolling into the heart of Beaufort, a strong flood tide aiding the work. And at, at 12 midnight, Beaufort and Moorhead City were completely wrecked. Um, so sometimes some of these articles, they, they don't get everything right, but you know, obviously it wasn't at 12 midnight, the, the Atlantic Hotel was still standing. Um, this is a postcard image looking to the west along the Beaufort waterfront um, where the buildings stopped. And I think it will, that probably was maybe around, for some reason I wanna say uh, Queen Street. Um, so they say every dock in Beaufort was destroyed as well as uh, 10 waterfront buildings, including an ice cream pavilion. Uh, this is what I got from the news articles of that time. A third of the town was in ruins. Debris on Front Street was 10 to 20 feet high. And if you've ever gone to survey the damage after a big storm like that, like along the waterfronts or on the beachfront roads, that, that's what it's like. Everything that was in that building where the water came into is now usually out of that building <laughs> and piled up somewhere. Um, Severe damage to the Ocean View Hotel. The storm surge entered the building through the first floor and the windows and the floorboards on the ground level were ripped out from the eight foot storm surge and the roof was torn off from the wind. So the interesting thing is this museum, I believe according to that map is standing exactly where the Ocean View Hotel was. So think about 1879 on Tonight, early, early tomorrow morning, what they were going through there, what the scene looked like. Um, so they rebuilt that Ocean View Hotel. Governor Jarvis, uh, he requests 50 soldiers from Fort Macon to come over and uh, guard the debris and the, the personal property in the streets. The, the people that were vacationing here and staying in those hotels, they were wealthy people. They probably brought a lot of expensive things with them. People traveled with a lot of stuff back then. Um, you know, you, we joke and maybe make fun of our spouses and say, what do you have in the suitcase <laughs> when we're getting ready to go on a trip? Um, but back then they would have had a whole train and cart load of trunks and clothing and jewelry and all kinds of things. Um, because they might stay for, for a week, two weeks, maybe even a month. Vacations back then were probably a little bit different than they are today. Um, so we've been focusing on Beaufort, but severe destruction was reported all over the county from Portsmouth up at Ocracoke Inlet uh, to Diamond City on Shackleford Banks um, and, and even farther northward. Your loss of homes and livestock, trees and fences blown down and swept away, piers damaged or destroyed, and numerous shipwrecks. It was pretty devastating. Here's some news uh, accounts of some of the damage. Um, 21 dwellings in Smyrna were destroyed. The Harbor Island Screw Pile Lighthouse was severely damaged. The Brant Island Lighthouse lost its roof. This is a picture of the Brant Island Screw Pile Lighthouse. Um, several windmills are destroyed in the area. Here's a picture of a windmill that was, uh, I believe, off the Beaufort waterfront. So we actually had windmills back then. Um, and they were a little bit smaller than your modern day windmill used to harness uh, power, to create power, but uh, we had them nonetheless. Um, I highlighted some of these news articles. Here's out of the Charlotte Democrat. Uh, the loss of people to Carteret County uh, is estimated at 500,000. Many vessels are reported destroyed. The, the pleasure boats are all demolished. The steam yacht Okalana 
broke from the moorings in front of the Atlantic Hotel and is driven about 30 miles above Beaufort where she lies in a, in a piece of woods. I, I think that was a misprint. <laughs> uh, I wanna go back just real quick to this map because I measured out 30 miles from Beaufort and that meant that that steam yacht would have been over here in Pamlico County. I don't, I, it might be possible, but if they say the storm surge was eight feet on Beaufort, it was probably somewhat less as you came across uh, the peninsula here. Um, the Core Creek didn't exist, but, and, and, I, and I think parts of, you know, is it possible the Harlow Canal? I guess it is possible, you know. So I don't, maybe maybe it really did go 30 miles and end up in the woods in Pamlico County. Um, at first I was like, well, maybe they meant three miles. It maybe ended up in the woods back here somewhere. But I don't know. I haven't found much else about it. Maybe someone knows and they can come tell me. Um, but that'd be pretty interesting. Uh, I heard stories of the Diamond Shoals buoy that got broke from its anchor off of Cape Hatteras during Hurricane Irene, I think, and it ended up in, in uh, Hyde County, washed across Cape uh, Hatteras Island, across the Pamlico Sound, and was found in Hyde County. Uh, a large schooner is on lookout shoals with no tidings of her crew. And I think that might be our whale boat that I told you about earlier. A thousand yards of Atlantic and North Carolina Railroad was destroyed at Shepherd's Point. Here's another map of the area. There's Beaufort on the right, there's Moorhead City. The rail line extended out here into the Newport River. Um, so they say a thousand yards was washed away. This little drawing depicts the, the station at Shepherd's Point and the, the terminal there. You see a little steam vessel coming in, a couple of people in a small rowboat, a train. Um, so things were, pretty well messed up in Carteret County. They say the market house, nine fish houses, six dwellings, a church and a school, and almost every boat in Moorhead City were destroyed. This drawing is uh, depicting Moorhead City in 1862, of what it might look like. There's the rail line. This is Fort Macon out here on the horizon. Okay. I, I promised I was going to tell you about uh, Cheeseman's Inlet. Here's a map from 1822, and it even has labeled on Bogue Banks, Cheeseman's Inlet, now filled up. So in 1822, that particular inlet was already closed. But in 1879, I bet it reopened from the hurricane, and maybe only temporarily. And it probably eventually filled back in with sand. But they say that there were two inlets cut during the 1879 storm. So maybe Cheeseman's Inlet got reopened and there must have been another one along Bogue Banks that got cut open. Uh, and they also say that the width of Beaufort Inlet was extended about 800 yards to the east. So that means the point on Shackleford got eroded away. And we've, we've been seeing that happen since it really kind of started with hurricane, the passing of Hurricane Sandy, that west end of Shackleford has lost a lot, a lot of land. And where it, it didn't disappear, <laughs> it's now on bird shoals and it's now on uh, short sand dollar island and, and it's now out in the ocean in the form of sandbars. Um, so <clears throat> there's some local fishermen in the area and they run into a Captain Ephraim Cook out of Provincetown, Massachusetts. And he's on his whaling schooner, the Seychelles. And they tell him, oh, August is a fine month for sailing the waters of the coast. I don't know if they were just messing with him because he was a, a Yankee or what. Uh, <laughs> this is a depiction of a, of a fishing camp out on Shackleford Banks. And these were uh, all dotted the coast, um, men that would be out there to to sane for mullet um, and, and harvest the bounty of the sea. But they, they run into a Captain Cook and they tell him, yeah, August is great. Um, 
these were just some some papers related to uh, that whaling schooner. So here's uh, news out of uh, Massachusetts, and, and they just like to keep people apprised of what their boats were up to. Uh, it says, arrived at Moorhead City on June 17th, the whaling schooner Seychelles of Provincetown, Captain Ephraim Cook. No oil reported, meaning that it had not harvested any whales yet. I mean, he was down here looking for whales, remember? They harvested whales off the of shackle for banks, and I suppose Captain Cook thought he would take advantage of that. Um, so we know that they, yep, yeah, the Seychelles is in the area by June, 1879. Uh, a month or so goes by and they get to experience one of the worst hurricanes on record. Um, so they're anchored in the hook. This is a chart of Cape Lookout. The Seychelles anchors in the hook. They say, oh, weather's kind of deteriorating. We'll anchor back here for safe harbor. Now, mind you, there's a, this says life-saving station, but this is a, this is a later chart. There was no life-saving station at Cape Lookout in 1879. The lighthouse was there, yes, but no life-saving station. Um, here is Wreck Point, uh, and Cape Lookout Point would be down here. So um, the, the account, basically, of, the, of uh, what the signal service officer observed from the keeper's quarters is that the, the Seychelles, um, located maybe about there, breaks anchor during the storm when the wind's out of the southeast. They drift across Wreck Point. Now, the, the, the vessel's drawing about 12 feet of water. So that means there at least has to be 12 feet of water over Wreck Point. So we know the storm surge is even worse out there as opposed to the eight feet on Front Street, uh, which makes sense. So they go out, drift out into the, to the ocean there. Then the, the eye of the storm passes, the wind switches, and then they get blown back. <laughs> and they end up wrecking on the backside of Core Banks. Um, here's another article out of The Advocate from Massachusetts, August 21st, after the storm. A dispatch from Captain Cook of the schooner Seychelles reports that vessel ashore and full of water at Cape Lookout. Um, the wreck of the Seychelles. They did not salvage the ship. The remains are still out there somewhere. Um, archae uh, marine archaeology students from East Carolina have been trying to locate the exact uh, spot. Um, you know, this is the life-saving station that would eventually be set up at Cape Lookout in 1888, but there was nothing there at the time of this storm. So the Great Beaufort Hurricane of 1879, they say that barely 50, 50 lives were lost in North Carolina and Virginia combined. Um, now the epicenter, the eye, the eye hitting North Carolina saw the brunt of it. And that's probably a testament to the low uh, number of people residing in the area, the population. Um, I mentioned the, the cost to Carter County, 500,000. That would be worth about 15 million today. Uh, we know that some storms of today cause a lot more damage and are a lot more expensive. It's not that the storms are stronger, it's that there's just so much stuff here. There's so much infrastructure and, and property. Uh, if you think about um, some of the storms that we've had you know, in the not too distant past, um, you know, Hurricane Florence, they say, was $1.8 billion in damage. A billion dollar, with a B. Um, and then what, one of the other storms that, that we kind of could compare this 1879 storm to is probably Hazel of 1954. Now, Hazel hit down in Brunswick County, um, and they said the estimated winds were 150 with a storm surge in some places of 18 feet. I, I think maybe it was a full moon tide, but I'm not sure it hit right at high tide. Um, we know that there was a storm surge at Cape Lookout with the, the 79 storm of at least more than 12 feet because the Seychelles went across Wreck Point. It was drawn 12 feet of water. <laughs> um, yeah, this storm, and because of Captain Cook, 
on that on that New England whaling schooner, most of the people uh, they heard that story, and the locals refer to this 1879 storm as Old Cook's Storm. Um, and maybe it's because they kind of thought it was funny that the fishermen told them that, uh, yeah, August is great. <laughs> we don't, you know, it's great sailing. And then his ship wrecks, or or maybe they thought it was pretty miraculous that they survived, that he survived. Um, but that's what they came to know the storm as, Old Cook's Storm. Um, nonetheless, it was, it was one to go down. You know, we, we judge maybe the strength and the power of these storms by things that we've experienced in the past. You know, none of us were around to experience this storm. So from what I've read and learned about it, it probably was the worst one to hit, directly hit North Carolina as far as strength of storm. Not necessarily number of lives lost, maybe, not, uh, at, you know, costs uh, monetarily, um, but probably, you know, strength-wise, wind very well could have been at Category 5. So here's to having a quiet 2023 season. Uh, we can keep our fingers crossed. Um, the advice I can give is to prepare uh, and prepare early. Do those things, steps that you need to do. There's lots of great information on weather.gov of what you should do. Uh, Carteret County does a good job of of disseminating the information too. Um, otherwise, be safe and enjoy your visit here to the museum. Uh, I can take some questions at this time and I might have some online too, um, but otherwise feel free to enjoy touring the exhibit gallery and enjoy your afternoon here in Beaufort. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? You got one in the back there.